Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The festivities are about to commence as we have a green skin mirror for this first matchup between ODM Shadoku and Iskandar Twohorn in this Warhammer World Championship matchup. So we, for the uh, green skins being led by Shadoku here on the green side, we are going to be having a rather large infantry, not going to be seeing any trolls, which is a pretty common pick here to be normally seeing trolls in a green skin mirror. So it is going to be Orc Bagans, though, for the bulk of that infantry. We do have quite a bit of mobility with some Orc Boar Boys as well. Going to be riding in the rear, looking to be sweeping into that back line on the opposing side. We actually have the Moon Howlers, the Goblin Wolf Riders ROR, and I'm not even sure what these guys have over the regular ones. Looks like they have Fear is what they've got um, and probably just a little bit better base stats but you really don't see these guys very often a uh, rather interesting little pick there uh, we have some goblins on the flanks uh, and then for the skirmishing it is going to be goblin wolf rider archers mixed in with some forest goblin spider riders getting that poison there always a nice thing to be having and then we have some more goblin wolf riders on the other side and then one more forest goblin spider rider and then for the i guess the very core it is going to be a orc shaman for the spell casting gonna be coming in looks like it is just going to be bringing that fist of gork giving magic damage because uh, savage orcs are a fairly common pick here so giving that uh, uh, magic damage will be able to cut through their physical resist a nice little bit there and then of course it is the goblin great shaman rolling in with vindictive glare as well as itchy nuisance to boot as well so reducing that melee attack base open damage in an aoe on the other side and victory of glare is always a very nice spell especially on top of the arachnorok spider very good um, angle of attack for that spell to really get off as much damage as it can arcane conduit and don't even try it and hiding directly behind it is going to be a goblin big boss with slippery and they needs stabbing so they need stabbing reduces armor by 30 and melee defense by 24 but that is going to be it for shadoku's green skins as for Iskandar, it is going to be a little bit more common with what you're going to be seeing in this mirror. Is we have stone trolls, we have a dust swamp things, which gives that fear and terror. And terror is a must have in this matchup. And then to kind of make sure that the terror on the other side isn't going to be much of a problem, it is going to be Grom the Ponch rolling in on his chariot with his immensity as he has language of the boys given that immune to psychology when he is in melee. The Great Un is here. Lucky Banner, and as well as the Axe of Grom for that armor sundering, armor piercing, and all that in case there are stone trolls on the other side to allow his units to kind of get a little bit extra more damage in. Force Gum Spider Riders then for the most part, and then a couple of Force Gum Spider Riders. We have an eight peak loonies, same as the other side. I think I did miss them from before. An Orc Shaman coming in. We have a Brain Bursta. We have that Fist of Gork, which is kind of for those Savage Orcs, but not going to be so useful against what Shadoku has brought. Here we go, plus 40 melee attack in an AoE, so really going to be looking to break through very quickly, and especially with all of the Savage Orc biggins, going to be making up the bulk of that army. And that is going to be it for that side, so let's get things rolling. As both sides are going to be looking to take that hill, but actually it looks like Shidoku is going to be a bit more patient here, seeing that uh, Iskandar really had that little, just that little leg up getting um, forward here, is going to be conceding that and just kind of fully, um, slowly kind of pulling back, going to be trying to pull Iskandar off of that hill and kind of back down where all of his... Uh, orc biggins and all the other stuff are going to be having a little bit better time they don't want to be fighting uphill and instead just going to be slowly kind of skirmishing their way back however both sides have pretty comparable skirmishing forces so really it's going to be kind of a wash i mean you do have some goblin wolf riders but on the other side you still have those uh, forest goblin spider riders so again even with the melee variant but you still have the orc biggins but they are the orc boar boys which are going to be kept in reserve though going to be just waiting to get those charges through their own lines and not really going to be putting that pressure on but we do have a little catch here. Forest Goblin Spider Riders are able to get a nice charge into these Forest Goblin Spider Rider Archers. So they will be able to get some nice damage in there. And Shinoku is going to be uh, missing these guys just a little bit. But again, it's not really that big of a loss. But he definitely would prefer to not to have lost those guys. And he is now going to be pulling them back, trying to get back down onto level ground. And Iskandar is in hot pursuit, but Iskandar has forgotten a few of his units up on the hill. The Stone Trolls and the Swamp Things definitely want to be with the rest of the unit of the front line here when they do hit that um, initial charge. 
and hopefully they are going to be remembered momentarily because that is definitely going to be a major stopping power that's going to be missed sorely in that frontline engagement. Moon Howlers are going to be meeting the charge of the Force Comes Spider Rider um, riders and having that fear here, especially without Grom too close by, is going to help getting those uh, guys a little bit lower. They did trade rather well in that engagement. Some units, though, are getting picked off in the rear. Uh, the Goblin Wolfrider Archer is going to be able to make a few catches of their own. So both sides losing a few of their skirmishers, but we do get a nice 8P Clooney here going right through uh, these uh, Savage Orcs. Uh, however, I think it clipped even the 8P Cloonies just a little bit as the uh, Goblin Great Shaman is going to be kind of walking back away from these Savage Orcs, but it is going to be pulling this one unit out of position and kind of seeing that, though, Iskandar is going to be moving his way back in. And now we're going to be getting the Fanatics from Iskandar this time. Going to be going right through these Orc Biggins, getting some a nice bit of value there, and might just go through these Orc Biggins as well, getting a nice little bit of extra damage on that front. We do have a Fist of Gork being popped down, going to be able to kind of bypass that physical resist of these Savage Orc Biggins. And if we look up to the hill, now these trolls are going to be coming down. Hopefully it is not going to be too late. They were definitely needed in that initial engagement. That is going to be a rather painful loss for Iskandar for sure. While that great Goblin Great Shaman right now is going to be providing that fear and terror in this engagement. And you're seeing that these Savage Orcs are really getting beaten down pretty heavily. Though they are able to dish it out. These Orc War Boys have taken a lot of damage themselves. Um, but these Savage Orcs do end up breaking. But that is still going to leave these Night Goblins. However, these Night Goblins probably don't want to be engaged for too much longer. Because if they want to get another Fanatics off, they're definitely going to be wanting to pull out and save that HP just a bit. The wall goes off though for Iskandar here. Going to be given that immune psychology and just a little bit extra melee. But a lot of his forces are kind of getting worn down the savage orcs taking quite a bit of damage so far but in comes the heavy hitters now the stone trolls and the swamp things charging forward and they are going to be hitting this front line very hard going to be doing a lot of damage but in response though the shidoku does use his own wa saving it just a little bit longer now waiting for those Swamp Fangs and all that stuff to kind of come into play. You didn't want to be using that too much earlier because then you kind of wasted that immune psychology. And that Arachnox Spider now is actually giving a Grom the business here pretty um, efficiently as he's doing quite a bit of damage to him. Grom going to be wanting to pull out, kind of look for his engagements elsewhere. As you are seeing more of the cavalry on Shidoku side start to kind of route here as the Savage Orc Stone Trolls really putting a major amount of hurt. And it's going to be leaving these Orc Biggins. However, Fistic Orc is popped on them. So that is going to be giving them that extra magic damage melee attack and melee defense so that will really be able to trade well into those savage orcs then at that point and now the stone trolls though looking to bring down that goblin great shaman getting a nice little attacks in and if they kind of push around their mass really will hold that goblin great shaman in pretty well and i think that orc shaman though however does not want to be engaging so close to that big spider and want to be pulling out bounce power so far pretty even at this point and things are kind of getting pushed up kind of close to that edge of the the white line there and that is not going to be good for Shadoku, especially with that Arachnox spider going to end up routing here of uh, getting out of the picture here that fear terror and the leadership for the greenskins definitely a painful loss for Shidoku, definitely does not want to be losing that, but it looks like it is, the pathfinding is a little bit wonky here, and it is actually going to be running the long way to the white line. Definitely a benefit for Shidoku, because had it routed to the closest possible route, I think they would have been losing that Arachnox Spider for sure. But as it is, there's plenty of skirmishing forces still left for Shidoku. Uh, not a whole lot of ammunition left on them, but probably enough just to get enough poison into these engagements. And I mean, if you look at what Iskandar has, I mean, he has a bounce power. He has Grom, who is going to be healing both of the Swamp Fangs and the Stone Trolls are also going to be regenerating. So the longer this fight drags on, the worse it is going to be getting for Shidoku. His spider has returned, he has his Orc Shaman, and a lot of his units are just kind of chasing things out, but they really do need to kind of push that fight, because they need to, um, if they can break these Stone Trolls and the Swamp Things, that is going to be a lot of the regenerating, but on the plus side, Ground Punch is taking a lot of damage himself, and it looks like we have a Vindictive Glare going to be going down from that Goblin Great Shaman, going to be making some connection, going to be clipping some of the Savage Orcs on the way in, but it is going to be getting Grom very low, and he is on danger low in terms of leadership, and he does end up routing, and this time around, it might be him that is going to be making a beeline for that white line, and it looks like he is going to be going straight that route as Balance Power shifts heavily into the other side, as Shidoku, massive power swing there, once Grom did end up routing. That was going to be that was pretty much done and dusted because he was much too close to be able to come back from that and things were looking a little dicey there for shidoku but with his arachnox spider coming back that really did help and given just a few extra spells going the other way 
really help push that into the red zone for Iskandar. Now, let's take a look at that after battle report update. The scorecard as well as Shadoku does take the first game. This is a best of five series after all. So plenty more games to be had. So for Iskandar's forces here, uh, we do have... Uh, the Swamp Things, Stone Trolls coming in a little late to the party, but that did not stop these Stone Trolls from generating almost 1,400 in total value, so a lot of value there. And, of course, having that Fear and Terror coming in from the Swamp Things, the Terror specifically, very um, nice because on the other side, there wasn't any immune to psychology, so you do lose th that when you don't bring Grom, and that is pretty much why you do bring Krom in this matchup is that immune psychology kind of make that fear and terror a wash on both sides as for the rest of the forces the all of the skirmish cap i think got bro broken down in that back line pretty well by shidoku because kind of in that late game you kind of see the kind of trickle ins from shidoku's uh skirmish cap while the rest of iskandar's was kind of a loss these Savage Orc Biggins doing some decent work. At least, well, one of them did some pretty decent work getting over a 1,000 in total value. The other ones, especially with that magic damage coming in from the Fist of Gork, uh, really allowed Shidoku to trade very well. And that was kind of a... I mean, not entirely a waste. You lose out on that um, bypassing a physical resist with the magic damage, but you still get that uh, increase to melee attack and melee defense from the, uh, the Orc Shaman on Iskandar's side. AP Clooney's got some nice value, 900, and Grom, not really all that great, but really it is mostly that immune psychology that you want him there for. And he did take a lot of damage. I think he had to be just a little bit more cautious that he was engaged with that spider maybe for a little too long earlier, and that did cause him to take quite a bit of damage in return. Now, as for Shadoku's green skins here, the Skirmish have did quite a bit better if we kind of do a quick little comparison to um Iskandar's, like almost generating i think like double the value so that was one of the big advantages there as for the rest of the mobility i mean even the goblin wolf rider archers got a lot of value themselves or poor boys uh not doing all too much nothing to write home about uh, moon howlers they were there uh kind of generating equal value to the rest of the goblin wolf riders i, I don't think that ror is necessarily worthwhile here uh you usually you don't see them that often i think that's kind of for a reason if you and you don't really see goblin wolf riders for the most part either you just kind of either you just see mostly just skirmish cav and if they are going to bring melee cav you are going to bring the forest goblin spider riders because they do have that poison and that just usually is way more advantageous than just having these cheaper goblin wolf riders uh for the rest of the force Go the orca biggins did a, doing some nice decent work themselves some pretty steady value across the board for those guys ap clooney's not doing as great uh, and then for the rest of the forces i mean the goblin big boss did actually some pretty good work with 950 doing i think most of the damage to grom um over the rest of it i think the rest of the damage was with the goblin great shaman on that arachnorak spider getting almost 1600 for that guy he, he is still a little bit more expensive i believe when he is on a spider but so nonetheless some pretty decent damage overall good f fun first game a little deviation from the I guess the green skin mirror meta, which normally you, the meta isn't as defined for mirror matches, but with how things are and how strong the green skins are, this is becoming a more and more common matchup to be seen in tournaments, and I think we've seen it quite a few times so far. But that is going to be it for game one. Let's roll on in to game two. A wild beast band pick as Malagor, the Dark Omen, flies on in to this game two matchup as Shadoku commands the Beastmen against Iskandar's Tomb Kings as they take to the Plains of Bretonia for their match. So for the forces of the Beastmen, it is going to be a really wide or really spread out build for the Beastmen as we have Gore Herds with shields with the Blackhorn Ravagers as well. And they do have that perfect figure, which is quite nice to be having. Of course, that is only while they ha have their leadership intact as well, because it does disable after their leadership drops below 50%, or it might be just with wavering. We have some Bastigors as well, kind of thrown into the mix to kind of just chunk through a little bit of that construct armor we have some centigors with throwing axes on the flanks for some mobility and some more centigors with uh just kind of for some nice 
quick mobility on the flanks some ungor raiders for archers we have five units of those so we're going pretty heavy in the archer department and some ungor spearmen herd in the back and then for the center ranks we have one more senegor and then it is going to be a gorbel for most of that um, construct killing power he is a bonus versus large armor piercing and then for his items he also has slaughterer's call which when he is engaged in melee so he gives plus nine melee attack charge bonus and plus eight leadership which is probably one of the more important facts of that ability um, in an aoe around him and especially against like the tomb kings that leadership really is a um, painful thing for the beastmen and he also has blood greed as well so he does have immunopsychology and plus 15 leadership when he is engaged in melee and then we have Malagor, the Dark Omen, as we saw earlier, we're going to be rolling in. This time he does have a Traitorkin. He has a Vile Tide, and Vile Tide does do very well against the um, Tomb King forces because they are really tightly packed, and you do need something that can deal with Tomb Guard very really well. So really cast this right into the middle of those guys, and just you will be able to slowly whittle them down bit by bit, because once like the Tomb Guard are out of the picture. The skeletons are a lot easier to deal with, especially when you're going to be having Bestigors and the like. He has Unholy Power, and of course that Primal Fury, and the, like it kind of given that immunity psychology. Now for the rest of the Tomb King forces, it is going to be Skeleton Horse Archers for that Vanguard. So we have four units of those. We have Setra the Imperishable on his War Sphinx. He is going to be rolling in with a few of his own abilities. So Nero's Incantation of Protection, giving that 44% physical resist. That isn't going to be helping against any of those Vile Tides, however. We have Dejas Incantation of Cursed Blades, giving that armor piercing and base weapon damage. And of course, you do overcast that. Gives a nice little bit of bonus versus large. And then he has that Restless Dead, really a nice lore passive to pair with these relatively cheap, so three and six for Winds of Magic Cows, just be able to spam those two spells for a nice little bit of passive he healing throughout the match. Then we have Kemrian War Sphinx kind of running in support of him, so two mighty uh, Sphinxes going to be striding forth, both of which are bonus versus infantry and armor piercing. Uh, we have Skeleton Chariots, and then a couple of Nehekran Horsemen in the back, so plenty of skirmish, so should be able to contend with the Senegors, and the Senegors are throwing axes fairly well though all of the archers will be a little bit of a pain for them for the infantry it is going to be skeleton spearmen and then we have a couple of tomb guard mixed into the lineup here for the tomb king infantry and then we do have some skeleton archers and just a couple of the regular ones none of the rors on the field and that is going to be the two armies. So let's get things rolling as the tomb kings are going to be skirmishing their way back to the rest of their line should be able to pull the uh Beastmen to them pretty easily. They should be able to out range or out damage the skirmishers on the Beastmen side. So really the Beastmen probably want to be pulling up all of their Ungor Raiders. Get a little bit of um, pressure on them. And they might be able to overwhelm them with just the amount of Centigors that they have. And if you take a look at like the stats department speed on the Horse Archers is 76. While the Centigors do have 95. So they will be able to eventually catch these guys. So the Tomb Kings do need to be mindful of that. So they can go a little bit more aggressive with their Centigors if they want to kind of pressure them. But of course you have Setra and the other Cameron War Sphinx. Which are going to be some pretty big deterrents to those just the regular Centigors. That's not the ones with um, great weapons so they're not really going to be able to damage the two sphinxes all too much they're really going to have to rely on the centigors with throwing axes the gorbel and just the amount of fire from all these ungor raiders will be able to do some damage but we do have Cetra getting a little maybe too aggressive here getting a charge into these ungor spearmen herds centigors are going to respond in kind and they are able to get some damage into these skeleton chariots and he does pop Nero's incantation of protection just to kind of keep him nice and healthy and that does give that passive healing because these skeleton horse archers have taken a bit of damage i think there must have been like a vile tide going down in the middle of these guys to have taken that much damage so early on but they have been able to dish it out in return these senegors are throwing axes have taken quite a bit of their own and they do need to stay rather healthy because they are going to be sorely needed to deal with two of the war sphinxes i don't think the one gorbel by itself is going to be able to handle that both war sphinxes though going to be deterring these senegors a nice little charge in but there's 95 speed is going to be able to keep them out of harm's way for the most part only dropping like a model or two and then on the flanks though we are going to be seeing some engagement with the infantry tomb guard going to be engaging with these gore herds now that is definitely going to be an engagement that the tomb guard will win relatively handily without any support but there is senegors and plenty of other units these ungor raiders maybe getting a little bit too far ahead um, but they are going to be starting getting their shots into the rest of the tomb guard forces and i think this is where malagor is going to be starting to get some nice spells in these tomb guard definitely are going to be in need of getting some vile tides cast their way 
But right now, Malagor and that Gorbul are going to be trying to chase down some of these Skeleton Chariots as they are pester pestering these Bestigor herds. And the Bestigors are a really expensive unit. Looks like we are going to be getting a Traderkin. We're going to be hitting the Cambrian War Sphinx as well as the Skeleton Spearmen. The Chariots hitting a lot of units there. So doing a lot of damage over time to these guys. We're going to be getting these guys down to crumbling as now even more of that infantry is underway. Tomb Guard We're going to be engaging with those Ungor Spearmen herd. And they'll again be able to win that engagement relatively handedly as the rest of the beastmen kind of fallen against the undead and balance power slightly in the beastmen favor though that is traditionally how the beastmen go into the fights is with that balance of power advantage but both of these Cameron war sphinxes are sitting very very healthy so that is going to be the biggest threat here for this army is those guys as the archers have taken a bit of damage themselves but they are all really blobbed up here so this would be actually be a really nice target for a vile tide if uh, Malagor is looking that direction we do get some Senegor's engagement though with these attack on horsemen and with all of these um, archer fire coming in from the horse archers those Senegor's stood no chance in kind of repelling all of that fire coming their direction and there is just a lot more infantry right now as the infantry for the Tomb Kings looks to be winning out for the most part in that front line. Bastigor is doing some rather good work, but really the Beastmen are a little bit on the back foot here as their initial charge is kind of falling flat as they are running out of steam just a little bit. While they still have plenty of mobility left, a lot of that front line is getting hit pretty heavily. And it looks like another trader can going down. This time it is going to be um, clipping, it looks like three units of infantry. So it's going to be getting a lot of damage there. So it looks like the Beastmen instead um, electing to be using that trader can over that Vile Tide for the most part. And we get a new Shafti summon in that back line. Going to be catching out two of these Ungor Raiders, sandwiching them between these Ungor Spearmen as the Senegors are throwing axes, trying to get some shots into these um, Skeleton Spearmen. However, it looks like both of these Ungor Raiders are going to be taken out of the picture pretty quickly. Their balance power is starting to shift a little bit more into the Tomb King's favor. As really, this Gorbal hasn't really gotten into any of the fights that it needs to. Both of the War Sphinxes have done a pretty good job of staying away from this anti-large duelist. And he instead is going to be electing to kind of roll his way into these uh, skeleton warriors as more shots can be ra raining in. But the Tomb Kings are getting a little um, blobbed up in the back. But at this point, doesn't really matter too much there as they are able to repel the Bestigors. And the Beastmen once again kind of getting put on the back foot here as they're being forced back to really kind of play now onto their mobility because their infantry has pretty much um, completely dissipated. So we have the Gore Herds still engage some of the Ungor Spearmen, but for the most part, it is down just to the Ungor Raiders and the Centigors with, of course, Malagor and that Gorbul trying to take down two full health Cambrian War Sphinxes not going to be holding my breath on that one there. Those two are going to be very hard to bring down for what the Beastmen have remaining. And they are going to be once again retreating in the face of the approaching Cambrian War Sphinx, who is going to be making a beeline right for these Ungor Raiders. Going to be getting a nice charge in, doing a nice bit of damage there, sending some Ungors flying. And that is also going to be freeing up the Skeleton Archers to just continually use up as much of their ammunition, just kind of peppering into more Senegors. So things looking rather grim, I think, for the Beastmen. They have lost that frontline anchor and now are going to have to just try and keep these Ungor Raiders alive to use up all of their ammunition because they have a bunch of ammunition left that is one thing that these Ungor Raiders do have is that ammunition um, but I don't know if they're going to ha really have that space to use up as much of that especially with these two War Sphinxes continually cycling around and um, punting that Gorbal right out of this engagement as Xetra charges into the Centigors doing a nice bit of damage there but the Gorbal finally engaging with what he wants to be engaged with and that is that Cambrian War Sphinx now the incantation of curse blades is off on the war swing so it definitely needs that incantation of protection because it is taking a lot of damage from that gorbel and both these war swings are not even giving it any attention is they need to continually just kick that gorbel out of this engagement or run away because they do not want to be stuck in because they are not even attacking at this point they are just kind of getting surrounded all of these centigors holding down both of the war swings and allowing that gorbel to just get a bunch of damage off and the balance of power now actually shifting into the beastman favor after it was looking very strong for the uh, tomb kings here but getting both of their war sphinxes caught out at this point the rest of the battle not really too much of a concern as now all of these ungor raiders getting some some of their shots in the skeleton archers using up some of their own ammunition getting some shots in 
but man, both of those core sphinxes just took so much damage. This one is crumbling, and Cetra himself has taken quite a bit, and that Gorpal took essentially no damage in return. Only thing dying on the Beastman side was some Centigors, and a nice Vile Tide right there into the middle of those Tomb Guard, taken down are taking their HP down, not really dropping any of their models, and that Gorbal is now in hot pursuit of the Cambrian War Sphinx. The Skeleton Horse Archer is going to have to just try and screen out this Gorbal, which they are going to be able to do, and that does allow that Cambrian War Sphinx to stabilize its leadership. Eventually got one of the Nero's Incantation of Protection, but I definitely needed that just a bit earlier. Vestigors finally do end up shattering as the Tomb Guard now going to be um, hounding these Ungor Raiders, and Cetra definitely needs to clean up the rest because they have used up a lot of their ammunition in the time that both of those War Sphinxes were getting beat down by that Gorbal. But at this point, Gorbal is very isolated, and I think the Tomb Kings, but they don't really have a whole lot left to do anything about it. The only thing left is like Cetra and that um, Cameron War Sphinx at this point. Um, both of these archers, I mean, their ammunition pretty much pretty spent. The big threat here is that Gorbal, and there is not a whole lot that the War Sphinxes can do. Things are now looking very strong for the Beastman. Things were looking a little dicey there. Their infantry pretty much losing out very early on. Um, and even their mobility was taking quite a bit of damage. But now that Gorbal turning the tide pretty much by himself. And just the mass of the Senegor is really holding those War Sphinxes in place. And now this War Sphinx is going to be going down for sure to that Gorbal and all those Senegors. And that is just going to be leaving... Uh, Cetra, the imperishable, as he's just going to be trying to get some charges in. But now, the late game, where that mobility of all of these Senegors is just going to be playing such a huge role. Cetra is going to be unable to really catch any of them. And all of the younger Raiders just kind of slowly fanning out, getting their shots in, whittling him down bit by bit. And I think as soon as that Gorbal and the rest of the Senegors make their way back here, that is pretty much going to be it because Cetra is not going to be able to handle this all on his lonesome. The only thing he has is just a very beat down unit of skeleton archers who are crumbling away and now they have disintegrated completely and it is down to just Cetra the imperishable but unfortunately it does look like he will be perishing this day as he kind of knocks down Malagor but gets a nice little hit in there as well but now in comes the cavalry gonna be getting a nice little surround off holding him in place and the Gorbal looking to finish what he started, looking to get a rear charge into Cetra, charging forward, <laughs> and just as he charges in, gets knocked right back out. Cetra says no to that charge. Gorbal gets right back up, tries to charge in one more time, but he will be finishing the job. Cetra is not going to be able to finish this off, and that is going to be all she wrote for game two. So let's take a look at that after battle report, get the um, scorecard updated as well. Um, a little comedic charge in by the Gorbal, getting his barrel roll in only to get knocked right back out by attack animation from Cetra. So let's see how everything did fare on both sides. So for the Tomb Kings, the Skeleton Horse Archers are getting some uh, pretty decent value overall. Uh, the Hecran Horsemen. Uh, the two Archers, though, did very good work, able to use up pretty much all of their ammunition. Uh, their all of the mobility and the infantry was really able to give them a nice bit of space to use up that ammunition and generate some nice value there. Both of the Tomb Guard did some decent work as well. Undead, not really all too great, but they're just pretty much there for that fear, terror, or not the terror, the fear, uh, kind of keeping them at bay uh, as long as they can. Uh, skeleton Chariots didn't do as great, but the two War Sphinxes, yeah, they didn't really do all too great either. I mean, Cetra the Imperial, when he's on his Sphinx with the spells that he was bringing, he's definitely approaching close to 3k in total value or in total cost so that is a little abysmal performance only getting 900 and they um, both of them getting caught out like that against that gorbal was really unfortunate there they needed to stay on in that mobility game continually weaving through that formation and i like they wanted to stay away from the gorbal but at the same time i think they needed to engage with it when they had infantry support so iskandar was being very cautious with them keeping them away from the gorbal but um, if they're able to cycle charge that Gorbal, especially with two of them, hit one, 
um, pull out, hit with the other, that Gorbel is just going get, to get knocked around all game long. And, and when there's only one of them as well, I think that is definitely the way to go with the Tomb Kings is to get rid of it early and not have to worry about it in that late game because that is what kind of caused them to lose out in the end. Because if you look out over onto the Beastman side, the Sendogors with throwing axes, 1,300 between the two of them. Uh, they definitely needed to be more of a focus fire from the Skeleton Horse Archers. They did, they did take quite a bit of damage, but they were able to stick around just long enough and were able to get a lot of value from them. Even the Sendogor is getting a lot of value. Uh, all of the Ungor Raiders, some of them getting some over a thousand on these guys, the ones that were able to use up their ammunition. Bastogors did all right, nothing too bad on that front, but for the most part, their front line really didn't generate a ton of value. They did lose out to the, all of the fear-causing units of the Tomb Kings, and of course, those two War Sphinxes definitely didn't help in that regard. The Gorbel getting 1,300 in value for himself, and then Malagor as well getting 1,300. So well played by the Beastman side, able to win out against the Filthy Undead. But that is going to be it for game two. Let's get on in to game three. It is going to be match point for Shidoku. So we'll see if he's able to finish off the series or if Iskandar is able to breathe a little bit of life back in it for another round or two. Slan looking to be adding a little bit of extra heat to the desert. Going to be rolling in against Bretonia. As Shadoku commands the Lizardmen against Iskandar's Bretonians in this Game 3 match. So for the Lizardmen army, it is going to be a rather spread out formation. We have some source spears. Going to be looking to really just kind of deter any of the Bretonian cavalry. We do have a couple of chameleon skinks to add to that. Some skink cohorts with javelins on the far flanks. And then a little bit of mobility of their own with some cold one spear riders. All these cold one spear riders do have bonus versus large and armor piercing. And that Slan Mage Priest of Fire can be rolling in a rather uncommon pick, especially uh, in this matchup. Well, I mean, you can do some pretty decent work against Bretonians with um, some of the nice, like, burning heads, for example. Uh, Fireball to maybe get rid of some, like, trebuchets and stuff like that. Uh, it is still an off-meta pick for sure, because, like, uh, life is probably the most common, especially uh, with normally bringing a lot of dinos. Uh, not a whole lot here, so kind of foregoing that, because, I mean, only the Cold One Spirit Riders would really benefit from any life magic, um, but otherwise, like, light and stuff like that. Normally, you are going to be seeing Mazda, though. Those big dinos are a major pain for the Bretonians. But instead, it is going to be pretty much of a rush. We have the cohort of Sotek as well, so they do have poison themselves, armor piercing, unbreakable, and then they do have the refuse to die, so they will um, avoid losing any models uh, for the duration of that ability. They will stay, still take damage, but their models will still all stay alive and fight all the way until that does expire. And then we have some Pterodon Riders up in the sky, a three a few units of these. So they do have those Rock Drops, which are really good against like Bretonian Archers, and they do have Poison with their Missile Strength as well. But for the Bretonians, they are going to be expecting a little bit of an Air Squad, as we have a Paladin, um, with King Lewin at Leon Kerr, going to be up in the sky. He does have, looks like, the Lion Shield, by the or the Sword of Corone, uh, giving minus 24 melee defense and minus 30 armor in an AoE center around him. Foe Seeker as well, they give him a little bit of extra speed. Some Royal Pegasus Knights, so they should be able to keep those Pterodon Riders in check for the most part. We do have a Damsel of Life, going to be giving a little bit of Earthblood for all the cavalry, and a little bit to the Paladin and King Lewin if he does need it. But King Lewin has his own little bit of regeneration, so if he is able to stay at least a little bit cautious. We shouldn't have any worries in that regard. We have some Knights of the Realm with some questing knights on that flank, and on the other side, it is going to be just some more Knights of the Realm, a couple units of those. So uh, not too heavy in the cavalry department. These guys do have 90 armor. They have a nice 68 charge bonus, and of course, questing knights, though, they will be able to kind of chunk through those big dinos a little bit, but they do have to be mindful of the Clothes and Spear Riders because they do have the bonus for just large armor piercing. But especially with all of this archer fire, so we have peasant bowmans in the back line. We have a couple of pox arrows, so two in total, and then the rest is just going to be the regular variant. So, but a ton of arrow fire coming in. But the front line is only going to be peasant mobs, and they're going to be very careful, kind of keeping their distance, allowing these peasant bowmen to fire away, because these Soros war spears are going to be able to make quick work of these peasant mobs and get right into those archer lines. And if the archers are going to be running away, that's going to be 
um, not very helpful for the Bretonians because they need them to be firing away for as long as possible. So the cavalry going to have to be on the aggressive side here, keeping the Lizardmen at bay, getting as many charges in as they can. But of course, they do have to be mindful of these Coldwind Spear Riders who will be trying to countercharge them as, most, as much as possible. That really is going to be how that cav engagement is going to be getting underway, is who gets the charge is going to be pretty much who's going to be coming out on top, because both of these have some nice, decent charge bonus, and it looks like, though, the Royal Pike is nice kind of feigning a little charge in, and that is one of the advantages of having those flying knights, is they will pretty much always be able to get a decent charge onto the opponents, and we did have a little fireball looking to try and get rid of that mage or damsel of life. Um, but for the most part, the, the slot mage priest is a little isolated, but the cold wind spear rider is doing a nice job of kind of just screening things out, getting a nice charge into all of these units. One of them, or these spears, did take the charge, and they took a lot of damage in the meantime. And it looks like we get a burning head as these knights of the realm do kind of charge right on into it. It's going to be going right through these peasant mobs, doing a nice bit of damage to these guys. But these cold wind spear riders, these Saurus spears as well, taking a lot of damage. So Bretonia off to a very a nice early start, getting some good engagements. But it looks like we're going to be getting uh, the shield. The old ones does go down just as the banishment drops down on top of the Bretonians. Doing a nice bit of damage, shattering these peasant mobs, and then getting these ones nice and low. Doing a little bit of damage to the Knights nice Realm as well. But more of these Cold Wind Spear Riders are just taking a bunch of damage. And now the Questing Knights surrounding that Slan. So things looking pretty good for Bretonia here. I mean, just some very good engagements right off the get-go. Pretty much getting rid of all of the Sora Spears. But both all three of the Terradon Riders kind of off in the wings. A little forgotten units, but the battle is not over just yet. Though it is quickly getting out of hand for the Lizardmen as now the Slan is in dire straits as King Lewin quickly in hot pursuit um, taking down that Slan I think that Slan pretty much going to be it uh, gone for the battle here already so I mean just so many units have been taken out of the fight for the Lizardmen already uh, we do have some of the Coldland Spear Riders coming back but losing that Slan is going to be so um, bad for the Lizardmen and completely gone now shattering and at this point the uh, Bretonians can now break off pursuit but King Lewin finishes the job getting rid of the Slan completely. Though for the Bretonians, the Knights of the Realm, and like all the Knights of the Realm, have taken quite a bit of damage, and now all of the Sora Spears and the Cohort of Sotek have put a lot of pressure into the Bretonian pe um, Peasant Bowmen. But King Lewin is still sitting very strong at this point. However, these uh, pet Royal Pegasus Knights trying to get rid of these Pterodon Riders, but that is just leaving them very susceptible to these Skink Cohorts with Javelins um, on the ground, as well as the Chameleon Skinks, and they are doing a lot of damage to them. These Skink Cohorts with Javelins have a lot of DPS. They have 120 models, all of them firing away, going to be getting rid of these Royal Pegasus Knights, and that is going to be one of the big threats in the air gone. But we still have King Lewin and the Paladin going to be able to kind of counter these Pterodon Riders, but the Terran Riders have full ammunition across the board. They have all their rock drops, and they're going to be able to start making their presence known. Actually, the balance power shifting a little bit back towards center here. It was really heavily in Bretonia's favor after that initial engagement. And King Lewin himself is very healthy, just rolling with that Paladin. Paladin does have a Guardian as well, so giving that additional... Uh, physical resist to King Lewin going to be keeping him in that fight though they are losing their questing knights here as the source uh, spears are able to kind of um, do enough damage before they themselves end up routing and the cohort of Sotek now charging for them they have armor piercing and a nice rock drop here right into these peasant mobs going to be causing them to rout as these knights of the realm now try and get a charge in themselves going to be going right through those skinks doing a lot of damage to them but now that they are embroiled in melee these cohort of Sotek going to be doing a nice and a nice refuse to die as well right off that charge now they are taking a lot of damage but they are still sitting at 85 models so they are able to really kind of chunk through the armor of these knights of the realm with that armor piercing and they're doing a lot of work there as balance power is now right back to middle here i would not have expected that especially with the lizardmen losing their slan so early on and losing all of their mobility pretty much conceding that to the bretonians but the bretonians have gotten beaten down actually as i was saying they're conceding that mobility game these cold one spirit riders are back very low in health but they have been able to shatter these knights of the realm and it is now down to king luna and the paladin in terms of mobility unless i'm missing any other bretonian units but i'm not seeing any more of the bretonian cav they got maybe a little too overconfident once the cold and spear riders and those initial engagements went so well but now the lizardmen are actually pulling the advantage into their favor as these cohort of sotek are unbreakable so they're just going to be able to continually chase things down the only way they're going to be able to get really screened out is if they're able to get their attack order pulled off 
and King Luin and the Paladin trying to do just that, but now all of these Terror Riders converging upon the rest of the units can be trying to get some shots in, and Earthblood trying to go off, healing the Damsel, I think was just trying to catch as many units as it can, but only getting that Paladin a little healed up. Just trying to get as much off as possible. But yeah, things are actually looking very good for the Lizardmen now. They still have some spears in the rear. And these Holdwind Spear Riders as well uh, will be able to have a nice bit of mass. But King Luin trying to separate them as he does charge on in. Of course, now he has to worry about all of these Sora Spears charging in right behind him. So he's able to get a few decent hits off. He doesn't want to be sticking around too long. Just get rid of these Spear Riders and then pull right on out. He doesn't want to be engaging with all of these Sora Spears. But he might want to actually now that he's seeing what's close by. He does have... Have his peasant bowman and if he does pull right on out these guys are going to be compromised right off the bat but he doesn't have a whole lot of time because there's some more source spears coming in in the back line looking to break these guys out so i think he's going to have to concede this position pull out and try and deal with like the terror riders deal with another flank here and because he does not want to be just stuck engaged in melee with all of these spears these chameleon skinks as well can be constantly poisoning him down it looks like the shots though are i think they were just targeting lou and they just went a little over over his head but he is just taking more and more damage pull out heal back up and then kind of wait because especially now that all of his units are being compromised here there's no real reason for him to stick around he will lose his damsel of life especially with these pterodon riders diving in but that is not an engagement that he wants to do there's way too much bonus versus large in that area and as well as all the poison coming in from the chameleon skinks but now the rest of the um, lizard men are starting to converge on their location of uh, the pterodon riders using up most of their ammunition but they are now going to be coming on into this final engagement as king lewin is just getting surrounded by all of these spears he does pop that sort of corone reducing the armor and melee defense in an a the aoe around him though that is not going to be all too helpful as it is just the paladin and king loon if he had some infantry in here as well that may be a different story or some knights but this is pretty much going to be the final stand of King Luin and the Paladin balance power is shifting a little bit more into the Lizardman favor as everything else for the Bretonians is getting routed off the map. There's like one more unit at just some peasant mobs off to the other side and seeing what is left. Iskandar does concede the fight, and Shadoku does take the series 3-0. Let's take a look at the after battle report. We'll update the scorecard as well to reflect the final score. And we'll go over the after battle real quick here before we close things out. So for the Bretonians, they had some very, very good initial engagements. They were able to pretty much eliminate the mobility on the Lizardmen, take out the Slan so early on. But after that, I think they got just a little bit too overconfident because like the initial values was pretty good for all the Knights of the Realm and the Questing Knights, but they just took some, I think, some poor engagements later on. All of their peasants really just didn't get any value at all. I mean, one got 980, another got 816, but a lot of them only getting like not even 100, 300. I mean, normally these guys are all generating like well over 500 apiece. Uh, they definitely got to compromise. I think that's just a little bit with the build there. They just didn't have enough of a front line, probably really expecting a more tightly boxed Lizardman build where they can just kind of sit around and get a lot of fire in. But when the Lizardmen do rush, that little uh, um, strategy doesn't work all too well because these peasant mobs are not going to be holding out very long. Uh, the Royal Pegasus Knights got some nice decent value, 1100 on those guys. Uh, King Lewin only 1100, not too great on that end. And I really do think that the Bretonians got a little overconfident. Now for the Lizardman side of things, the Sinkorts of Chaps did some nice work. And oh man, look at the Chameleon Skinks getting 1200 and 1100. And I think a lot of that came when that Royal Pegasus Knights uh, got engaged with the Pterodon Riders up in the sky. Just all that poison and all that focus fire too from the Chameleon Skinks. So they can do quite a bit of damage to those guys as well. Pterodons doing some decent work. Were kind of a little forgotten or at least kept in reserve for the initial parts of that battle. Especially with those Royal Pegasus Knights roaming the field. They didn't want to be getting too far ahead. But I think they were forgotten for just a little bit longer than Shidoku would have wanted. Uh, for the Spearmen in the front line, they got 1,100 on these guys, 700, 1,000. And yeah, these cohort of Sotek, though, they did so very nicely. 1,500, that armor piercing, they were just able to, once the Cav got the charge into them, they were just able to grind them out bit by bit and just generated a ton of value because I think they're only like 600 in total cost for these cohort of Sotek, 600 or 800, one of the two. But regardless of which, more than paying for themselves, very nice value on those guys. 
Cold and Spirit Riders, um, able to come back in that late game. Some of them did get some nice bit of value, and just having just that little bit of extra mass to hold down like King Lewin uh, in the end, and just being able to chase things off as well was really nice to have. Slon got some decent value, some nice kills, but... Uh, Overall, it's just kind of a wash. I, I still think, yeah, the Slod Mage Reads of Fire, just not the right pick here. Uh, maybe a good idea, but still, um, yeah, it just didn't work out. And they didn't have enough support either. Like, it just allowed the Bretonians to get that uh, easy value in very early in that fight. But regardless, the Lizardmen were able to pull their way back and pull out a victory as Shidoku wins out 3-0. This was from the round of 64, so just kind of going back a little bit for some of those early stage games that I didn't see were casted. So just kind of picking a few of them before the tournament does wrap up this weekend. Regardless, very fun series, some nice matchups, and that is all I'm going to have for you today. I do hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, have a good one.